Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guest today is an old friend, Marjorie Spruill, a former center, uh, Wilson Center fellow, I should say, who retired from teaching at the University of South Carolina in 2017, but remains very active as an author, consultant, and a historian on a range of projects, some of which you'll learn about today. She joins us on the occasion of the centennial celebration of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, also referred to as the Women's Suffrage Amendment. Marjorie, welcome virtually back to the Wilson Center. Great to see you. <laughs> nice to see you, John. So let's dig right into the subject matter. You know, when you look back at the history, right now, first of all, it's hard to believe that it's been 100 years, but it's also hard to believe that it's only been 100 years that women have had the vote. And, and how close was it back then to that not happening? Oh, it was very close. Uh, it actually came down to one vote. We just made a new documentary that is entitled By One Vote. Um, and that was in Tennessee. Uh, after lots of ratifications went through, they ended up coming down to it in the summer before the November 1920 election. And no more states were set to be meeting. And Woodrow Wilson had to apply a lot of pressure to the some governors. So he got the governor of North Carolina and Tennessee to call special sessions. And then North Carolina promptly uh, voted it down, called on Tennessee to join them. And it, then there was this long fight in Tennessee with all everybody coming in from all over the country. And it, it looked like it was going to lose. And then famously, this guy named Harry Byrne, 24 year old Republican from the mountains, got a letter from his mother and there you have it. That hadn't happened. Um, I, the country moved into a decade of reaction. Uh, it could have been a long time before we got any kind of national suffrage. You, you couldn't say no to mom and that, and that changed history. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in doing research to speak to you today, uh, looking back at the R women's right conventions at Seneca Falls in 1848, which was a, a precursor to what happened, uh, I was surprised to learn that uh, voting was on the list, but it wasn't a top priority. That's right. It was considered to be such a shocking thing that they uh, felt like that all of the other things that they were asking for would be in jeopardy if they did something so radical as to ask for the vote. But um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, I think, was influenced by a trip to London earlier where she had run into the Chartist movement over there. And so expansion of suffrage was on her mind. And then Frederick Douglass attended, and he felt that suffrage was super important. And so the two of them made a real strong case for it. And it was narrowly added to the Declaration of Sentiments. Now you worked on this exhibit at the National Archives, which uh, unfortunately COVID-19 has gotten in the way of people visiting in person, but it's still online. The exhibit called Rightfully Hers. I'm wondering, you, you went into it as an expert. That's why they asked you to work on the exhibit. But in the process of, of, of creating the exhibit, did you learn anything new? Yes, I did. Uh, I learned uh, a lot more about um, the years after 1920 and the the ongoing effort that needed to take place after 1920. I certainly knew, was familiar as someone who works on Southern history as well as women's history, that though the 19th Amendment did give all women who were citizens the right to vote, and I knew that for another half a century, African-American women were going to be barred from voting in the Southern states but I wasn't familiar with the story about Native American women uh, and about how the United States uh, has treated people in the territories. And um, of course, I, I was reminded of the fact that you folks in Washington, DC don't have full voting rights and still don't. Yeah, and, and it's, it's stunning where you, you know, we have a tendency to think of history as uh, this was when it happened, a light switch occurred. Wow, everybody could vote. But uh, the still states had a lot to say about this and they could create barriers and it wasn't. So, so with that in mind, how long did it take after passage on, uh, on a, a ratification on August 18th, back in 1920? How long did it take then to get to a place where 
the work was done. Interestingly enough, on August 18th, 1920, the work still wasn't done because the Tennessee Speaker of the House pulled all these parliamentary maneuvers. And so it took another week. Uh, and so the big day that we'll be celebrating is actually August 26th, Women's Equality Day. So, and, and even then, John, uh, these people who were fighting it continued to fight it. And it, the Supreme Court finally in 1922 uh, heard the case of the, the American Constitutional League was putting in front of them, trying to say that the 19th Amendment wasn't even legitimate and they dismissed that case, ruled against them. And so it was really only then that that, that fight was over. But you're there asking was, about- I'm sorry, after, go ahead. But you were asking me, I believe, about uh, what happened after that. Yes. One of the biggest turning points, of course, was 1965, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, because essentially what happened then is that the federal government finally enforced the 15th and the 19th Amendments. Uh, mind you, and throw in the 14th, since it also applied to voting rights. And um, it called on uh, the federal government to uh, send in marshals and to monitor um, elections that were going on in counties that had a record of discrimination. And the, at that point, the numbers of African Americans uh, who were being allowed to register to vote in the Southern states varied quite a bit from state to state. But nonetheless, it was appalling. And after that, the rates went way up. And um, we say sometimes, as we talk about woman suffrage, that it was really only in 1965 that we finally had universal suffrage for all in the United States. So w where are we today in, in, in terms of this progress? So you, you've written a book about how the women's movement has divided, divided we stand, the title. And it's sort of split in two between a conservative version and a liberal version, oversimplification. I'll let you provide the details. Where do we stand? Well, we um, stand in the middle of, a, of a, a period in which voter suppression has become a huge issue again. Uh, we are now in need of another massive suffrage movement. Uh, and I believe that one is underway, uh, unfortunately, after a half century after the 1965 Voting Rights Act, um, well, for a half century after that, that that amendment, which wasn't, that bill, which wasn't permanent, but had to be renewed, was renewed again and again under both Democratic and Republican administrations. It was expanded so that it also looked after um, the needs of people who were uh, ethnic minorities, Spanish speakers. And then with the American Disabilities Act, it was also um, uh, the case that we did something to make it easier and facilitate voting for people with disabilities. And, and that trend just kept going on. Then there was motor voter during the Clinton administration to make it easier to register. Uh, there was a bill to uh, make it easier for our people abroad who were serving in our armed services to be able to register and to vote. Uh, also expatriates, people, Americans who have voting rights in our elections who are Americans and, um, and have chapters uh, abroad. So it kept on for a, quite a long time. But then in the early uh, 2000s, during the Obama administration, there was a bit of a change of heart. Uh, it's, uh, it, I think it's not at all a pretty story because it's pretty clear that it's very related to partisan politics. Um, it's related to growing recognition of the fact that our country is increasingly non-white and that the day will come when it is minority white. And uh, there are quite a few conservatives um, who were very wary of that and are deliberately trying to suppress the vote. Um, it's it's um, presented as a uh, worry about voter fraud, but investigation after investigation shows that there really isn't very much of a problem with voter fraud, except for with the people who are trying to suppress the vote. Yeah, the facts show suppression is the problem and not 
fraud or, or fear of fraud. With, with, with that in mind, I, I wonder, you know, we, John Lewis just passed from this earth, a great loss for the nation. The, you know, when, when Mr. Lewis was uh, encountered pessimism about the possibility of change, he would often use his own life experience to say, don't tell me change is impossible. I, I lived it. And it makes me think of the whole, you know, a favorite Martin Luther King notion about the moral arc of history is, you know, or the, the arc of history tilts toward moral. Uh, and I know I'm crucifying the, the actual quote, but I wonder I you as, you uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I hope our viewers and listeners do as well. <laughs> the, but, but I wonder you, you know, both as a human being with skin in the game, but also as a historian who looks at the long arc of history, how do you view this? Do you, do you view it pessimistically that even as far as we've come, we still have all these problems to overcome? Or are, do you tend to m the more optimistic view that over the course of time, we've made progress and will continue to make progress? I'd like to compliment myself and say I'm more like John Lewis. Um, <laughs> I am an optimist. And I also Great. think that uh, looking back over history, you definitely can see how much things have improved for women uh, and for African-Americans and for other human rights uh, movements in our country. Um, and I'm feeling like it's a tough time right now, but uh, I think people are, uh, I'm encouraged by the developments of the summer, as tough as it's been. Uh, the um, protests in the streets are having a real impact. We are seeing the kind of changes that we haven't seen for a long time. And in fact, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think that some a lot of voters have learned a lesson. Um, I think there's going to be real change. Yeah, tough times are often the precursor to that real change. Yes. Let me uh, ask you uh, about other projects you've been working on, from HBO to PBS to the archives, what we already talked about. I know you have a second edition of your book, One Woman or uh, One Vote, coming out. Just tell us about the things that you're working on. Yeah, interestingly, the, the book, One Woman, One Vote, I prepared that. Uh, 25 years ago, for the 75th anniversary, um, the producers, Ruth Pollock and, was, uh, and uh, Educational Film Center in uh, D.C., uh, was preparing a documentary for the American Experience, BBS. They discovered there wasn't in existence a really good anthology on this that told the story from beginning to end. And they asked me to do one as I had just finished two books on women's suffrage. And uh, all these years, the thing is still being used very much. Uh, and uh, so we decided to update it, to add some additional material, uh, things that have to do with an international context of women's suffrage, uh, a lot more about the South and about the race issues within the women's suffrage movement. Um, and, uh, and I took my short introduction and, put, and have just fattened it up like crazy because I've learned a lot in 25 years about woman suffrage. But also, it, um, I'm, go, I'm sorry, Marjorie, go ahead. Uh, the documentary, One Woman, One Vote, that we did back then has been reissued this year and is being shown. Um, and it has a new introduction and conclusion by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, in Tennessee, where there is incredible amount going on despite the epidemic. Uh, the pandemic. Um, they are, National Public Television has put out this documentary that you can find on their website if you just go look, um, called By One Vote, Woman Suffrage in the South. And I and a lot of other historians of the movement uh, are on there talking and then interviews with Harry Byrne that someone taped long ago. It's just really terrific. And there are lots of documentaries uh, on uh, that have been on PBS and will continue to be on all month. Uh, all of the major museums and galleries in DC have wonderful exhibits and in every state throughout the nation, people have been working hard you know, for years now to prepare for this. So it's a, a tremendously exciting time in terms of paying a lot of attention uh, to the history of women's suffrage and to the whole subject of women in politics. What I started to ask you when I stepped on your words, which I apologize for, was when will this second edition be released? I believe it will be September. Okay, great. Something to look forward to. And about the, the thing you just ended on, that all the preparation for the centennial, 
uh, COVID-19 has changed the way that you'll participate, but will you be participating remotely in events? Yes, I am. I'm uh, recording uh, short greetings through the National Archives. Also, um, a short message that will be uh, at the unveiling of the statue of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Sojourner Truth in Central Park. Um, and I'm doing an hour-long, hour-and-a-half-long program that the um, National Democratic Women's Club is going to air on August 26, taping a, a talk with Manoa uh, Elfelman of Tennessee uh, that's going to go with the dedication of a statue. I, I was supposed to be there in person to do this, uh, to have the honor of giving a talk at the uh, at this statue of that um, monument to Tennessee suffragists. It's um, about the, I believe, the fifth, maybe the sixth statue that's gone up in Tennessee over the past five years, uh, celebrating their role uh, in, in this crucial, their crucial role in this suffrage battle. Well, congratulations to you on your crucial role in sharing this, these important <laughs> stories with us. You know, I can't think of a better person to talk about on the occasion of the centennial. Thanks, Marjorie. Thanks very much. And enjoy your, your virtual visits. Sorry they won't be in person, but maybe someday soon we'll be able to sit in the same room again. That would be lovely. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, to our viewers and listeners, thank you as well. Hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again in the future. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.